what is the lipid energy model and how would you how would you describe it to someone who's kind of hearing it for the first time yeah um, I'll reiterate that the lipid energy model is a mechanistic explanation of the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, which again is defined by the three cut points, LDL greater than or equal to 200, HDL greater than or equal to 80, triglycerides less than or equal to 70. So again, mechanistic explanation. I'll give the very short version and then dig a le level deeper. Just quickly on those cutoffs. Yeah. Are they just arbitrary kind of values or how did you come to that? Dave came up with them in 2017, and it, again, was one of those things where he just made an observation and created cutoffs. Um, it's funny because people come up and say, you know, oh, am I a lean mass hyperresponder? And then they give their numbers. And my response is typically, look, physiology does not care about the arbitrary cutoffs we generate. So for classification in medicine, we need to create cutoffs. And usually cutoffs are created to optimize sensitivity and specificity so that you'll pick up people who have a particular characteristic um, and it's as it's, it's specific as possible to that population. So there's always an optimization of sorts. Um, those cutoffs seem to do relatively well for picking out this phenotype, but there is what I would call just an element of judgment in terms of like, if a lean person sees a LDL jump of X amount along with an increase in HDL and decreased triglycerides, when they go low carb, like the same physiology could be applying even if they don't hit those cut points. And in terms of are those the optimal cut points or just historic, I'd say really they're just more historic and it could be optimized with further literature. That'd be my answer. Um, now, for no further procrastination on the lipid energy model, uh, at a very high level, it's a, um, it proposes that there is a, a response to carbohydrate restriction and typically in lean insulin sensitive people, such that there's an increase in systemic, when I say systemic, I mean whole body, um, fuel trafficking of fats um, through a system that depends on lipoprotein particles as the shipping containers for the fat. That's the very high level overview. Now, to dig in with a tiny bit more specificity, what we think is going on is um, when you go low carb, you start burning more fat as fuel. So your fat cells are releasing free fatty acids into the bloodstream. And those free fatty acids are used by muscle tissue as fuel, but there's a lot of free fatty acids in the bloodstream. Um, and actually, if you're leaner, the free fatty acids go up more with fasting and carbohydrate restriction. That's well documented. And then they can be taken up in the liver. When you say there's a lot of free fatty acids, so more an excess of free fatty acids are released from adipose tissue beyond what's needed by muscle cells? Locally, yeah, because you're releasing them into the bloodstream and then they end up circulating around in the blood so they can get used locally. If a, like a fat cell on my arm releases some free fatty acids and it can be used by a muscle, but it also goes into the bloodstream, can be used by other tissues. Um, how that's coordinated, <laughs> how fat trafficking is coordinated and energy trafficking, read the ANGPTL paper. We won't go into probably in this podcast. I don't think we'll have time, but it's incredibly dynamic. Um, if you Google, if you go to PubMed and go look up ANGPTL 348 and read those papers, you will just be shocked by how um, beautiful and specific and targeted like fat trafficking can be. But simply put, yes, that there is more that is you, there's more that there is more that is released than is used locally by the muscle tissue, and then that will be taken up by the liver. And in the liver, these three fatty acids, sorry, the, the fatty acids can be repackaged onto a storage form of fat called triglycerides. Um, and so you generate these triglycerides, um, which then get packaged into VLDL particles, very low density lipoprotein particles. And I know I'm stating it, this happens, that happens. Just to be clear, this is the hypothesis. There are elements of it that have not been proven certain things you need to do, tracer studies, we get into that in a little bit, but um, just to be clear about what's proven and what's not. So the free fatty acids, they go into the liver, they're packaged into triglycerides, they're put on VLDL particles, these big, let's say, boats that allow the triglycerides to be put back into the bloodstream. So the very low density lipoproteins, VLDLs that are triglyceride rich, are put into the bloodstream where they recirculate to resupply depleted fat cells and um, muscle tissue with 
triglyceride fuel. So the triglycerides can then be broken down, taken out of the VLDL by lipoprotein lipase, and the fatty acids go into the fat cells and the muscle tissue. And as this is happening, so this turnover process, when I say turnover, I see the VLDLs having the triglycerides sucked out of them by the lipoprotein lipase. This is really the, the, the money shot for how the, the, the phenotype, the, the lipid triad emerges. Because what happens is if you have this VLDL, this triglyceride-rich VLDL, and you're sucking up the core, which is the triglycerides, and you're doing it fast enough, the triglycerides are going to drop as they're depleted out of the VLDL. So your triglycerides go down. That's one part of the triad. VLDL are going to shrink. As they shrink, they become LDL. And LDL have a much longer residence time than VLDL. So the LDL can go up. You take the big sphere, you shrink it into a smaller sphere, and the smallest sphere is the LDL. LDL goes up. The triglycerides have gone down because you've shuck, shrunken out the core. And then if you take a sphere and you decrease the volume, you're taking the core out, you have to necessarily decrease the surface area as well. And there's cholesterol in that surface to give the lipoprotein particle structure. And those surface remnants are shed off, um, hat tip to the work of Anatol Kantush um, and the reverse remnant theory, which was very influential to our work. But the, um, the surface components are shed off and picked up by acceptor particles, which are APOA particles, HDL particles. And so then you have the cholesterol being shut off from the surface being picked up by the HDL particles, and so the HDL goes up. And so it's in this turnover process, this really rapid turnover process of the VLDL that you have the triglycerides drop really quickly, and the LDL go up as the VLDL become the LDL, and then HDL go up as they accept the surface components of the VLDL. And so that's how you get the triad. And I'm sure we'll, we'll hopefully get the chance to go into it, but understanding that process helps us understand why we see what we see with respect to lean mass hyperresponders and even counterintuitive findings like those that confused Lane about why, how the Oreo versus statin study, the Oreo is not only dropped my LDL, but actually dropped my triglycerides, which would actually be predicted by the model in the acute setting, because if you have an acute insulin spike and you're activating LPL, uh, lipoprotein lipase, because insulin activates lipoprotein lipase, and this turnover is acutely accelerated in the fasted state when there aren't chylomecrons around, then it's going to suck out the triglycerides even faster, your triglycerides should drop. So in the Oreo versus statin study, actually during the Oreo arm, my triglycerides were in the 30s. So that point there about the, the liver is producing triglycerides because more free fatty acids are entering the liver. Mm -hmm. And that is downstream of free fatty acids kind of being, I guess, liberated, for lack of a better word, from adipose tissue, which is downstream of essentially uh, carbohydrate restriction and different energy substrate availability. Mm -hmm. All right. So this system is adapting as a response to carbohydrate restriction. Now, some people may think if the if the liver is producing more VLDLs, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, that you would see elevated triglycerides. And I'm just repeating back mm -hmm. what you said to me to ensure that I'm hearing it correctly. But in this phenotype, you don't see elevated triglycerides. Yeah because of the, how rapid the turnover is from VLDL to smaller ApoB containing lipoproteins. Yes. And that is because there is a high demand, I, I presume, by these tissues, adipose and the muscle cells for triglycerides. Mm -hmm. So they're sucking the triglycerides essentially out of the VLDL in a re very rapid manner. Yeah. So you can have an increase in triglyceride export and VLDL production from the liver and still have triglycerides go down if turnover is fast enough and you reach a particular steady state. So it's very consistent to have increased triglyceride export from the liver and lower triglycerides given high rates of turnover. So the really key thing, I'll say this like 12 different ways, is in LMHR, increased VLDL export, increased export of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins from the liver in the form of VLDL and coupled with increased turnover by lipoprotein lipase peripherally. Okay, so this also kind of gets to something else I've seen you explain or comment on it. There's this idea out there that LDL cholesterol is going up 
in lean mass hyperresponders in this phenotype because there is sort of down regulation of the LDL receptor. There's less clearance. And I think that um, I've seen Thomas Dayspring kind of posit that this is because of ketosis, it's because of high saturated fat content of the diet. But I, I think I've seen you push back and say, well, actually, it may not be that there is reduced clearance of LDL cholesterol. Can you unpack that? Yeah. Let's, when we're saying reduced clearance, I want to focus on reduced absolute clearance. But let's just focus on the logic, and then I'll, I'll, I'll make some points about data in my sphere of awareness. You don't – that's the thing. The hang-up is the perception that there needs to be reduced clearance for levels like this to emerge, which is not the case. Logically, it's not the case. If you have increased production and increased turnover, you could actually have – increased clearance. In fact, if you want me to pose a bold hypothesis, I think in terms of absolute clearance, there is increased clearance in lean mass hyperresponders versus the average person. And that's perfectly logically consistent. It's like saying or asking the question, you know, if I have a funnel and pouring water into the funnel is production and the water pouring out of the funnel is clearance, is it possible that I can raise the level the resting water level on the funnel um, while also increasing clearance. So making the neck mm. of the funnel wider. Yeah, if your production goes up enough. Right. If you pour more water in, you can also increase the neck of the funnel and water levels can still go up. So the steady state doesn't tell you about flux, nor does it tell you about clearance. So we, I, there isn't reason to believe that there is reduced absolute clearance in terms of just the logic of it. Now, let's get to the data. Um, you mentioned saturated fat. In the general population, saturated fat will tend to increase LDL cholesterol, and the mechanism has to do with reduced clearance because saturated fat relative to unsaturated fat will reduce LDL receptors. That's correct. What do we know about lean mass hyperresponders? Or actually, let's generalize. What do we know about the relative impact of saturated fat versus something like BMI on LDL levels on a low-carb diet? Well, we actually have very strong data on this now a meta-analysis of 41 RCTs I mentioned earlier, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition by first author Adrian Sotomota et al. And what we see is that BMI, which is relevant to the lipid energy model, is hugely dominant over saturated fat. doesn't mean saturated fat doesn't have an impact, but BMI is hugely dominant. If you look in the supplement, for example, I think being in the top quintile of saturated fat intake, sorry, top quartile, the top quartile of saturated fat intake has less than one-fifth the impact of just having a normal BMI, having a BMI under 25 for increasing LDL on low-carb diets. So point being, there's something else going on here. Um, now, as for Thomas Dayspring's claim, he's claimed a few times, and I have pushed back that he said his words were, and I think I'm getting him word for word here, ketosis lowers LDL receptors. He said that a couple times, right? That's like pretty accurate to what he's saying. I'm not taking it out of context. Um, and I've asked him when he's posted that, what are your data to support that? Um, and he's never replied with any data. And I'd, I'd hold him to the standard of actually providing data. I, If we're talking about ketosis, now I would hold him to also the standard of being verbally precise. Then we're talking about the process of having elevated ketone levels in the blood, which you can look at with exogenous ketones, which has been done, say, in murine models, mouse models, where ketosis actually increases LDL receptor on the liver. It doesn't decrease, it increases LDL receptor on the liver. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, he actually meant ketogenic diets, not ketosis. So just a, a slip in verbal precision. Do we have data on that? Um, Actually, we do, and this is something we discussed on Chris McCaskill's podcast, Plant Chompers, um, who pushed back with us. So this isn't like a, you know, a low carber going after Dayspring. This is just asking for legitimate data and then presenting the data we have, including a human RCT in which um, humans on a high saturated fat ketogenic diet had their uh, LDL receptors measured in circulating cells. So I want to be clear, it wasn't the liver. And that was just a methodological limitation because you can't take healthy people and an ethics board won't let you do a liver biopsy on them. It's kind of a giant needle being stabbed into your liver. So, But they did have LDL receptor expression on other cells. And LDL receptors, even in a high saturated fat ketogenic diet context, did not lower LDL receptors. 
So if we have data showing ketosis in mice increases LDL receptor expression in the liver, and human RCT data showing that LDL receptor expression is not reduced by a high saturated fat ketogenic diet, which actually surprised me. I would have th thought that a high saturated fat ketogenic diet would have had an effect. And we have meta of RCT data showing that saturated fat has a tiny, tiny impact as compared to unsaturated fat. And consider the fact that saturated fat doesn't do a good job of explaining the triad of markers we see in lean mass hyperresponders, nor the inverse relationship between BMI and LDL, and the fact that we have LMHR on low saturated fat diets. Saturated fat is not a good explanation. I feel like that's a pretty solid case for that. Do you agree? Yeah, I think, I mean, the data that you've put forward, particularly that meta-analysis, mm -hmm. makes a compelling argument that in low-carbohydrate context, I think yes. that's important. Of course. That there's a stronger correlation between BMI yeah. and LDL cholesterol. And the interventions that you can leverage in this context are different. You get more bang for your buck for adding the sweet potato than you would for subtracting the butter. Right, which is really important for that population and at the same time shouldn't be conflated or confused with general population. Agreed. So we just have to separate the two. Please do. Yeah, um, which is not that hard to do. So back to the lipid energy model, mm -hmm. what happens when you add Oreos in to uh, someone's diet who is an LMHR, why does their APOB or LDL cholesterol plummet? I think a simple way to think about it is um, hepatic or liver glycogen depletion is probably the trigger starting off the whole process. If you want to think about it in, in a demand sort of manner, when liver glycogen stores get depleted, it can be a signal that we need to shift fuel substrates to more fat because we don't have dietary carbohydrates on board and you don't want to do too much gluconeogenesis. So we want to burn more fat. And so that starts the flywheel of the lipid energy model. Now, in terms of the actual hormonal mediators, well, there's things like insulin, which are going to decrease free fatty acid release from fat cells, changes in leptin even, which can occur acutely. Um, in terms of the whole hepatokine, adipokine network of hormones that are really mediating the effect, I would say that's still in the area of speculation and where I'd really want a longitudinal multiomic study to dissect. Mm -hmm.